All right, this is our review for China and Russia. So we'll just start with our chart, which we did in some of the classes. We didn't do in all of them. Uh, but it's always a question, can be on there, is it unitary, federal, that kind of thing. So China is unitary. I'm like, this is participatory. Unitary in Russia is federal, which is easy to remember because this thing is the Russian Federation. China is also easy to remember the fact that it's unitary because China is never going to give up that much power to anybody. Okay, That would mean they would have to give power to the locality. So you think about a country like China, why would you choose to be unitary? It's because they want to consolidate power. And also, being federal is helpful when you have a diverse population, like Russia does. Um, and remember that China is predominantly Han Chinese, so there's not a whole lot of need for that. Okay, then we have, are we presidential, parliamentary, or mixed? And both of these guys are mixed. And... Would we say that they are liberal, illiberal, democracies, or authoritarian? This is not one on your chart we can add in. China would be authoritarian, and Russia would be a illiberal. And what's the difference between an illiberal and liberal democracy? Yeah, both liberal and illiberal, and illiberal democracies have elections. The difference is whether or not your civil liberties are being protected. And we talked about lots of civil liberties violations in Russia, a lot of them related to Putin. So can you give me an example of a civil liberties violation in Russia? Uh, the uh, monitoring of the Internet, the fact that Putin banned memes. <laughs> yes, definitely. Uh, the censorship of the media, the fact that almost all the media is nationally controlled. Um, when the, some of those you know, the videos we were watching, how that they've gotten rid of any kind of private media. Um, <laughs> yes, you speak out against Putin, you get killed. Um, also, you have the issue of um, um, journalists disappearing. We talked a lot about it. There's uh, the lack of LGBT rights. I mean, we could go on for quite a while. All right. Um, what else do we, we have on that list? Head of state and head of government, right? So typically your head of government actually has more power, but for both of these cases, it's kind of the opposite. So because our head of state in China would be the president, who's also called the secretary general, and that's Xi Jinping. And in Russia, that would be the president, and that would be Putin. What will we do when I can't talk about Putin all the time? Um, and then uh, I can justify it now, but I won't be able to justify it. Secretary General, that's the head of the Communist Party, the Secretary General. And then um, the head of government is the premier. He's the like the prime minister, Lai. You're not, I wouldn't worry about knowing him. Kate, okay, yeah. And then the head of government in Russia is the prime minister. Maybe, I think that's right. All right. Um, legislature, right? Okay, so in China, the legislature is the National People's Congress. That actually just recently met. They meet for once a year. They meet for usually a couple of days. Um, it's over 300 people, but we're talking to representing a billion people. So, And the fact that they just rubber stamp whatever the party has said, the Politburo and the Standing Committee. And then Russia is official name is the Federation Federal Assembly is the big name, like Congress. And then it's broken down into the upper house is the Federation Council and the lower house is the Duma. So let's talk a little bit about these powers that they have because this is actually kind of an important question. Uh, which of these two would you say is more powerful? It would be the Duma, and the Duma has very little real power. What would you say is like the one real check that the Duma has? Uh, Who do they have to approve? They have to approve the Prime Minister. They actually do approve, yeah, a lot of those things, the cabinets and um, uh, officials, justices, all those different things. But the big one is they approve the Prime Minister, because remember the Prime Minister is appointed by the President, Okay. And the president, he is directly elected, but remember they do a runoff election in Russia? 
you have to get what? Uh, over 50. So 50 plus, which would be the majority. In America, we always say the word majority, but what we really mean is plurality. Plurality is you're just the guy with the most votes. Okay, so like if I had candidates A, B, and C, which A is Putin, of course, right? So like in the last election, he got like 62%. The other two guys got votes too, but we don't need to have a runoff because he got more than 50%. But if we'd had A, B, and C who got 45%, 40%, and 15? That's the right math, yes. Okay. Um, well, we would do that if we were in the UK and we're in Parliament and we need to form a coalition. Yeah. But here we would have to have a runoff. And who would the runoff be between the top two? We'll study Nigeria soon. Nigeria also does a runoff election. Um, Iran has done runoff elections too. So you take your top candidates. Uh, we don't do this in the U.S. Hey, guys. Um, and this is just a plurality. In the U.S., we would just say candidate A, one, right? All right. So you got to have 50 plus. You got to have the majority. And then he, the president, appoints the prime minister, but he has to be approved by the Duma. So this is like really the only real check that the Duma has. Keep in mind, though, what can the president do to the Duma? He can dissolve them and dismiss them, which he hasn't, but uh, Yeltsin had threatened to do it one time, and that kind of kept them in line. Okay. President picks the prime minister. Theoretically, he's supposed to be somebody from the majority party. Um, and theoretically, you know, maybe he's coming out of the Duma, but that's not a, it's not a requirement. But he does have to be approved by the Duma. So that's the real, only real, one of the big checks that they have. Um, tell me some other ways that President Putin has consolidated his power. So we know that we would say that he, that Russia is moving. A lot of people would argue that Russia, while it is an illiberal democracy, is moving more and more towards an authoritarian state. And a lot of that would have to do with Putin. And we know that he's been in some form of power since you guys were born. He served as prime minister, then president, president, prime minister, president. And he's in the first. How long, uh, how long can you serve as president in Russia? It's six years. And you can serve two terms, and then you have to take a break. But then you can come back. You just can't serve more than two consecutive terms at a time. So he's in his first six-year term after doing two four-year terms. Remember, they changed the Constitution. So he theoretically could serve another six years. So, yep, if he's not dead, yes. <laughs> but theoretically, yes. Remember we looked at that political cartoon, and it was just... Putin and Medvedev, and it just kept going back, and they just kept getting older and older. Yeah. Um, so it, it is a six-year term. I know there's a question about the length of term for presidents. Um, what is Putin's uh, party, by the way? There's a question about, like, on there about political parties in Russia. United Russia, mm -hmm, with the big bear, you know, because he hunts bears shirtless on a horse. Uh, anyway, the um, this is what should be on the Internet, right? Um the, remember that parties in Russia are based on leaders or like people, personalities are not based on ideologies. Like in our country or the UK, it's based very much on ideologies. We don't really have parties that are centered around a person. With the exception, you know, every once in a while, like for example, when Teddy Roosevelt ran on the Spoiler Party with the Big Moose Party, that party was centered around him. Uh, but that's not something that's typical in the US. All right. Um, so give me some examples of Putin uh, leading Russia to a more authoritarian state. Hello? Hey. She was, yes. I'm not sure. Um, yes, try, try Sammy's room. Okay. That was in China. I that oh, okay, the riot girls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So stuff like that where we see the crackdown on uh, civil liberties. Yes, you could definitely argue that because yeah, si since his rule, like we see journalists disappearing, like it's on average every year journalists disappears. Uh, we mentioned before you guys came in several civil liberties violations. I'm thinking too about specifically about how he changed the fact that he appoints the governors now of the regions. Like that's a big thing. The fact that 
one of the members, so remember the Federation Council, like from each region, one of the federal council members is appointed by the governor, and the governor is appointed by Putin. I mean, like there's this whole kind of cyclical thing. That's also that asymmetric federalism, you know, we think about how the fact that it's not equal. Like in, in America, the 50 states all are on equal f standing. Uh, but in Russia, it's asymmetric federalism. They're not on ill-equal standing. Like Chechnya obviously doesn't have the same rights as some of the others, although it is a semi-autonomous region. Who appoints them? Putin. They appoint uh, one of the Federation Council. So from each region, I believe, is it three members that come? It's two or three members. Did you say he recently changed that he appointed the Yes, it was like in the last uh, maybe five or six years, I remember. Uh, they, the, they were chosen within their own regions. So it would be like if President Obama or whoever was president said, we're gonna pick, I'm going to pick the governor of Virginia. So you can imagine that that would not go over well in America. Uh, you know, we have such a strong state's rights. So, like, in the, when we talked about the U.K., we saw that the U.K. is unitary, but they're leaning more towards federalism because they have that devolution of power. We see the opposite in Russia, where Russia is a federal state that is becoming more and more unitary because they keep taking power away from their regions, and that's called centralization. So you, those are kind of the two, the two sides of the coin. Okay. Um, are we okay on, like, President, you know, and he's like the commander in chief. You know, when we think about Russia compared to the UK, and, and they're a good country to compare Russia to the UK. You can even look at Mexico and Russia when we're thinking about the whole ideas of like coups versus revolutions. Which which one's changing your leader? Which one's changing your regime? Coup is changing your leader, which is your government, and revolution is changing your regime. Regime is your type, what we would say in America, like your type of government. Are you a democracy? Are you communist? What are you? So when would there be, have been a revolution in Russia? The Russian Revolution, 1911. Okay. Yes, 1911. Um, and then, yes, 1911. I'm, ha I'm having a, that moment. And then uh, you could also argue... Um, yeah, in 90, 90, 91, when they end the Soviet Union, and then it becomes, because that would move from, this 1911 moves, you can just say the Russian Revolution, you don't even have to tell me the year, you could just say the Russian Revolution, or you could also say the Bolshevik Revolution, which is a regime change from at that time period, an absolute monarch, or having a czar, to going to having um, communism. And then the other regime change we see is the end of communism, when we move into um, democracy and the, the federal uh, Russian Federation. Uh, and then what coup did we see in Russia? When they tried to overthrow Gorbachev, remember, was at the very end. I forget the exact year of that. Was it 1990 or was it 91? like stepped in and like stopped them from taking over. Yeah. Um, and you could just even say the coup to overthrow Gorbachev. I'm not going to take off points because you don't remember the exact date. Um, so just remember the difference is a coup is overthrowing a leader, revolution versus regime. It doesn't have to do necessarily with violence or whatever, those kind of things. Often the military does lead a coup, but that's like they did in, uh, in, in Russia. In China, what's the big revolution? What's the big regime change in China? Yeah, with Mao moving to communism, <clears throat> and that happened in 1949 when they become communist. And how does, speaking of communism, let's kind of transition, transition to that, what's the big difference between, like, Mao's communism versus Lenin's communism? Um, Where's Mao's support base? Agriculture. Agriculture and the peasants. And Lenin's support base is, like, the industrial workers, and, and the peasants, too, to an extent, but it's industrial workers. He's trying to be more true to kind of what Marx said. Uh, Mao is more of a uh, departure from, from Marx. And then after Mao, we see a real departure from Marx with Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping, he's not embracing the peasants anymore. I mean, he's, he's embracing workers, and what is Deng Xiaoping bringing in that's going to make that huge difference? Deng Xiaoping, what is he bringing in? The four modernizations, 
which will bring in foreign investment, which Mao was completely against, right? He's going to bring, he's going to say that education is going to be expanded beyond elementary school. Um, Mao was only looking at the, kind of the young kids. He wasn't concerned about that. And what, and the real thing is he's bringing all those new aspects of market economy. Remember that he talks a lot about one China, two systems, um, Hong Kong is a perfect example of that, one of those special economic zones, Macau, Hong Kong, the fact that they are allowed to have. Hong Kong really operates under pretty much pure capitalism um, and versus, you know, there's very few places in the world that are pure capitalist. Hong Kong is a good example of that. So is uh, Singapore. But they were allowed to do that. That Remember that whole analogy of it you know, doesn't matter if the cat's black or white as long as it catches the mice. So it doesn't matter if we're doing communism or capitalism as long as we are making money. And that's what he means when he says one country, two systems. That's what he's talking about. Okay. All right. Um, so we talked about Mao. We talked about communism. So speaking of, what other, any other communist leaders other than Gorbachev I might want to know for Russia? Stalin, five-year plans, not a nice guy. Before him, Lenin, maybe. Lenin is the one who established it, did the vanguard kind of idea, uh, democratic centralism. And uh, Gorbachev is your other big one because he's the last leader. And Gorbachev, remember with him are those two vocabulary words, glasnost and perestroika. Glass is going to be political openness and then perestroika. That's your economic openness, economic restructuring. So which one of those two would we compare with Deng Xiaoping? Because people love to compare Gorbachev and Deng Xiaoping. Perestroika. Because remember that Deng Xiaoping never allows, sorry, I got some of them. Uh, he never allows that openness. Like, what's an example of him definitely not allowing openness? Tiananmen Square. Perfect example of how he crushes any kind of dissent. Um, Ding, per, Tiananmen Square would be an example of Deng Xiaoping not allowing any kind of freedom of speech or openness. And, and what, what happens as a result of allowing these things? What happens to the Soviet Union? It collapses. I mean, that's a big part of kind of what we were talking about in that, um, that article that we read. Like, is China going to collapse? Because China is not allowing that freedom that the Soviet Union did. They like to compare them because they both were doing perestroika, which is allowing some market economy in the midst of having communism. But he also said something about the, him being more, not having the openness. He didn't have the openness the way that Gorbachev did. So that would be with Glasnost. Yes. Because Glasnost, Glasnost is having like democracy and freedom of speech, and perestroika is having capitalism. Yes, he just wanted to build up the economy. He wasn't worried about giving people rights. And an example of him crushing people's rights is Tiananmen Square when they killed the people who were protesting. Well, then they don't have the openness. They never have it the way, which is one way. That's And that's what we're looking at that article. Jai still doesn't want to give that. Yeah. We see, so if you're looking at like your spectrum, like Mao is hardcore, okay? Communism, you know, I heart communism t-shirt, Okay. And then we're moving away with that, with Deng Xiaoping, with Zaman, and then especially by the time we get to Hu Janato, who is one of these technocrats. You know, that's a big difference we've seen with leaders like Hu Janato and uh, Xi Jinping. They're the technocrats. We've got this whole new group of people who are interested in economics and business. But then we got Xi Jinping here. Who is a technocrat, but he's also a princeling, which means he's a descendant of these revolutionary guys, and he's more in love with Mao. Like, he's got that cult of personality. He's w wanting less and less economic liberalization, which Ding tried to bring in. Is cult of personality or cultural? <clears throat> cult. Cult. Okay. C-U-L-T. Like, I follow a cult blindly and don't question. And Did you say culture of personality? I'll know what you mean. <clears throat> I did think it was so funny. That's why I sent that picture. I got home last night, and my cover, I because I just described to The Economist, and the first cover is exactly what we're talking about. Okay. Um, what other things have I not hit on your review chart? I was trying to hit the stuff as I'm thinking about it in my head. Uh, we should always know cleavages. Cleavages for China, what are those going to be? Gender, urban versus rural. 
ethnic, which remember that the majority of China is Han Chinese, 92%. So those ethnic minorities don't have a whole lot of rights. And it's because there's so few of them. The majority of are Han Chinese. I would say that age could be, is going to definitely be one in the future. Yeah. Was that, the video we watched today, was it like 2050, that 34% will be aging population? Yeah. I think it was 2020. Was it 2020? That no, soon? It was 2020. It was 20 from that article we read. Okay. Oh, Definitely going to see a major aging population soon. Yeah, we're going to have to run into that whole 421 problem. Um, and so... Remember that there might be a question, I'm pretty sure there's a question about the ethnic minorities, um, the fact that they don't have a lot of rights is because there's so few of them. Um, but even, you know, 1% of a billion people is still a heck of a lot of people. And so the Tibetans, the, the Uyghurs, like these are groups of people who are wanting more rights. Um, I don't think I asked that for your short answer. I think your short answer, I lean more towards that economic liberalization question we talked about with the air pollution and the uh, water pollution that are results of all the factories and everything they've built. And what are some of the things that they've done to stop that, Wait, so to combat that? Yeah, let me do Russian cleavages real quick uh, before I get too off topic. Um, ethnicity, urban versus rural would be another one. We didn't talk about as much about cleavages in, China, in Russia. Mm -mm. It wasn't as big of an issue. It has been in every other country we've kind of talked about. Urban versus rural, those are the big ones. I, I would argue that the Slavophile versus Westernizer would almost be a cleavage. That whole, like, you know, clinging. To, yes, the xenophobia, yeah. But that Slavophile of clinging to the, uh, we want to do everything Russia, Russification, and then the Westerner, let's look more towards how the West are doing things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fear of foreigners. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And then the church, you know, has become more and more important, the Orthodox Church, um, you know, all of those different things, exactly. Um, okay, now let's go back to the question we were talking about. Mm -hmm. About the economic liberalization and the impact on the environment. So what's a policy that the Chinese government has done to help combat all of this? They will literally shut down factories. Like, they will say, like, for the next two days, like, nobody can run the factory. Like, that's one of the things they will do to help combat the air pollution. Um, they're working on putting in stricter um, to actually enforce their, they're giving their version of their environmental EPA, their e Environmental Protection Agency. They're working on giving their uh, environmental uh, law group more authority to, like, enforce things. Yeah, and they, they actually put more of the blame on the privatized companies. They said that the privatized companies are doing more of it versus the nationalized. Yes, give them money to help. Like, I'm we're sorry everybody has cancer in your village. Let's just, what was it, 50 cents? Yeah, 50 cents or something? Yeah, some ridiculously low amount they gave to the people. Yes, okay. Liberalization is like an, an openness. So, like, we're saying economic liberalization. We're saying that you are moving towards capitalism or market economy. We're privatizing industries. We're letting the people, individuals, have more say in things. Yeah. Hmm? Yes, exactly. It like yeah, it's definitely a result of the industrialization. They're, they're tied together because they've increased the industry. And that was one of his uh, four modernizations, definitely. Yeah. Um, remember that Mao has a lot of base with the uh, PLA, the People's Liberation Army, that that was a big thing with him, that that was always kind of the arm of, <clears throat> of his rule. Also, remember we're thinking about China's organization, that who has the most power, the CCP and then the Politburo, and then that seven group people. So above the Politburo, which is the 25, then it's the, um, I want to say it's the Standing Committee. Am I stating that right? Okay, so... Let me just double check my, I don't, I don't want to miss, yeah, I want to say the seven is a standing committee and I don't want to miss, yeah, I had drawn one before, this one's a little different than the other one I gave you, but yeah, we have the, um, like there's the, I got too many things on my board.
So this is in China. <clears throat> All right, so you have the CCP, the Communist Party. Um, you've got the National People's Congress. You have the Politburo. And then you have the Standing Committee. So this has the most power. Okay. They're the ones who choose the, and I think, um, it's the seven group of seven, right? yes, the small group of seven. This one is 25, and this one is seven. This is where you guys are doing the article, like the women, and there's only two women yeah. who are in the Politburo. What's the, um, the form of patron clientelism that they use in China? Oh, uh, well, yeah. Zhongzhai. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's it called in Russia? What was it in the Soviet Union? Oh, Nomenclatura, yeah. and I don't think I'm spelling that right, but you get the idea. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah. There's a question on both of that for both of those on the test. I know okay, there is. The one for China called? Mm -hmm. okay. I know there's one, and I'm pretty sure there's a question about this. That's why I mentioned that. What is that? The who has the most power? This is the patriot clientelism, the Zhongzhai. Yeah. The most democracy you're ever going to find in China would be where? At the localities, because they actually elect their local leaders. They're even allowing some political parties at the local level. Not on the national level, but at the local level. Also keep in mind that if we're looking at people who protest, it's usually the peasants, like that local level. On average, there is a peasant protest every single year in China. I was just reading an article about this. It, well, I think it's a different question, but... I think part of it has to do with the fact that Mao had such a respect for the peasants, like that kind of continues. Um, but there, they, with what I was reading, um, I had at um, my little nerdy AP group, uh, they were talking about how that the media really doesn't find out about it because you know how China is so closed about letting things out. But on average, every year there's a big peasant revolt. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I don't know how many thousands of people. Yeah, it's not like they're actually successful in taking over or changing anything. Yeah, that's kind of the sad part. <laughs> Who's missing? Um, all right. Um, Russia, what's their, what's their biggest resource in Russia? Where do they make their money from? Oil and natural gas, the coal too. But oil and natural gas are number two. I sent you a reminder yesterday. I knew we hadn't talked a whole lot about it. It was a question about what's their biggest resource, uh, one of the resources, and then what is the government doing to kind of control that? And I gave you some examples like nationalizing uh, businesses. Also, um, the, they have like fired certain CEOs who don't play ball, if you will. Uh, and um, there's been other CEOs that help fund like Putin's campaigns and stuff. So there's definitely still that. It's not nomenclatura, but there's definitely still that good old boy system work in Russia. Um, there's another one I was going to mention to you. Those are big things. Let me look here and see if there's any. Source of legitimacy in Russia uh, would be the Constitution. Obviously, uh, President Putin is charismatic authority. I would definitely say there's some charismatic authority with him, although he... Yeah, they're making definitely more songs about him and everything. Isn't that insane? Uh, just kind of, it's crazy. Let's see, we talked about, oh, with resources, China, remember that China is a huge country, but they have very limited resources. Um, they just, they don't have the coal and the gas and the, and the oil. I think that's always important to remember. So trade is important to them. We've discussed Chechnya, Putin's super presidency, the Czechs, Duma has very few Czechs. Um, that's where, like, all of your provinces or regions are not treated equally. Um, part of that is Putin gain more power, and part of that is to give more autonomy to certain regions to let them kind of do on their so own. They're, they're There's 83, I believe, and they're, but they're not all equal. So they're asymmetric for that region? Yeah, they have asymmetric federalism as a result of that. Kind of like, yeah, which goes first, the cart or the horse kind of idea. Chicken or the egg. All right, we know our BRIC countries. And we can find them on a map. So Brazil, Russia, India, and China, they're pretty easy to find on the map because they're our biggest countries in the world. Brazil and South America, Russia, 
India, China. And so why are they called the BRIC countries? Well, that, obviously that's an acronym. They are the kind of uh, fastest growing economies that are, we call them advancing economies because they're new they're new to the market economy. So they're not like America who has had capitalism from day one. They are countries that have become more and more market as they have proceeded and their economies are growing at these very impressive rates. I like to say they're the countries to watch. They're called the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China. That would be a short answer I would pick to do because it's an easy one. Maybe. There's no K, honey. B-R-I-C. There is actually now, they're calling them the BRICS. They're calling them the BRICS, B-R-I-C-S. You might have an idea what the S is. South Africa. So, because South Africa's always been capitalist. It's in its very tip. I mean, it's changed more since apartheid. But, yeah, there's a lot of white South Africans. Yes, majority is black. Compared to like, say, Kenya. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, we talked about the regime change. We talked about compared Mao and Ding. The Cultural Revolution, Great Leap Forward. Those are all Mao's ideas to kind of keep the revolution going. We talked about one child policy. I mentioned the revolts. The current economy of China, remember that it is a socialist market economy today, that while it is communist, it does em employ market aspects. We remember what the mandate of heaven is, kind of like the divine right. What's the major reason many people of other countries oppose free trade with China? The human rights violations. People don't like to trade with, like, we were just talking about apartheid. Uh, in South Africa in my World History 2 class, and most countries actually uh, did economic sanctions on uh, South Africa until they ref uh, repealed apartheid. Hmm? We did. It's actually one of the few override vetoes because Reagan actually vetoed our decision to, uh, to do sanctions on South Africa, and Congress overrode his veto. So it's one of the few. There's, that's why I remember we talked about the Olympics, how a lot of people didn't like they're doing. So, did you say something about um, H&M, like, isn't that, <clears throat> like, remember, don't they, like, isn't that, like, a factory thing where they make, like... I don't remember. I think I talked about when we did globalization. Yeah, like... Is that kind of, like, the same thing? Yeah, like, some people don't like to shop at H&M because that's why it's, everything is so cheap, because they treat their workers so horribly yeah. overseas. Like, there was a, a year ago, or maybe two years ago, there was a factory that actually burned down, and most people in the factory, what like, so... Uh, human rights violations. I think we hit everything on the review. All right. Uh, I'm going to give you one more hint for coming, but is there any other questions, General, before I... About the relationship with Hong Kong. Yeah. Oh, Hong Kong is like we were talking about before, that it's the one country, two systems. The fact that they really give Hong Kong a, a lot of autonomy. Hong Kong is one of those special economic zones, and Hong Kong is allowed to practice capitalism and that whole kind of market economy as a result of Deng Xiaoping. But recently there's been protests in Hong Kong because they're not getting uh, their presidential, uh, their candidates have been limited. So um, China still is trying to control Hong Kong, but they have a lot of autonomy. But it's that whole thing, one country, so it's all China, but two systems. The fact that we can be both communists, like on mainland China, but in Hong Kong and Taiwan and Macau, we can allow capitalism. Yeah, and I don't think I have a specific question on the the, so the CZs. That Taiwan and Yeah, they're pretty much the big ones. Um, what'd you say were the most people in China? They they're Han Chinese, like Han Solo. Hey, whatever you can do to remember stuff, I say. That's what I say. All right. <laughs>